Hey, what is up everybody? Pastor John John here, and I'm so excited for this new season of Life Groups. Uh, I'm all about small groups, and uh, if you've been hanging with us here at City Life for a while, you probably heard us say that the most effective way for us to grow in our faith is through small groups. It's doing life with other people. Now, obviously, I love hanging out in church on Sundays and attending big services. That's always exciting. It's exhilarating. It energizes us. But where the rubber meets the road is when we can actually hang out with others and just ask questions and pray for one another and hear from one another. That's where where growth happens more quickly, in my opinion. So I'm excited for this new season because we're going to take eight weeks as a church to explore the book of Philippians in the New Testament. We're going to go verse by verse through all four chapters of the book of Philippians. And uh, my hope is to just grab a few nuggets here and there to kind of throw them out your way. And then there, right in your small group, in your life group right there, you guys can just kind of chop it up, talk about different things that you feel like God's speaking to you about, and then exhort one another, encourage one another, help each other in your journey of faith. So let me kind of throw the backdrop to the book of Philippians. This is obviously inspired by the Holy Spirit, and God used the Apostle Paul to write this letter. And he was writing this letter to the people of the city called Philippi. And these people were very dear to him, very precious to him. Um, Philippi was a city in the eastern side of Greece, and it was the portal, if you will, for the gospel to enter into Europe. The way it kind of happened was, Paul has this vision this one one time, and uh, in this vision, he hears this man from this region called Macedonia calling out for help, and he's asking for someone to come with some help. Paul understands this to be God um, speaking to him and challenging him, compelling him to go and take the, the, the gospel, the good news, not just to give it to the Jews in Jerusalem and that region, but then to bring it to the Gentiles, the Greeks, uh, in Europe and beyond. So he responds, and in time, God opens these doors, and Paul eventually uh, comes to Macedonia, and he, he arrives at this city of Philippi, And we actually see it recorded first in the book of Acts, chapter 16. The way they would do it, they would go from place to place and they would try to find uh, Jews who who already, you know, people who feared God. And they would go to synagogues and different places to, to pray to God. And there, Paul would then exhort and tell people about Jesus being the Messiah that God had sent to bring salvation to all mankind. So he goes, Paul, with some of his uh, uh, team members, they go into Philippi, and there, there's not a synagogue. So these Greeks, there's Greeks and Romans there, and, you know, they they spoke Greek and maybe some Latin. There were no Jewish synagogues in that city, so he he sneaks out outside of town to a a river, likely, and there he meets a a gal by the name of Lydia, and she had actually become uh, one who believed the God of, of, of the Jews, she, she was practicing Judaism, if you will. And so she had a fear of God or a fear for God, but she herself hadn't heard the good news of Jesus. So Paul begins to share with her, and um, she actually believes. The Bible records that she and her household then became, uh, became believers of, of this gospel, the good news. And uh, she was a businesswoman. She, she sold fabrics and different things. And um, so in the book of, of Acts chapter 16, we, we, we see that Paul would then have these prayer meetings uh, with Lydia and that the, the company of believers that were assembling there. If we kind of fast forward through the, the, the chapter, chapter 16, there's this gal, she's a little slave, and she's, she's got a, a demon spirit that gives her the ability to, quote unquote, read the future like a crystal ball or whatever, the gift of divination, right? And uh, Paul one day gets a heck of annoyed with all this, so he casts this demon out of this girl. Her masters get really worked up, and they are, they are just ticked off because they lost their business, essentially. So Paul and Silas, one of his interns, um, they are thrown into a jail cell, and, uh, and, and there at that night, you know, they're incarcerated, they're locked up, they continue to pray and sing songs, and an earthquake comes and uh, rocks that place, and all their, their shackles fall off of them, the, 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 the jail, the cell doors open wide open, and all the prisoners are, quote-unquote, free to flee, and yet they all remain. The jailer freaking out, understanding that, wow, if any one of these prisoners escapes, he's going to be liable for that. He gets ready to kill himself. And Paul says, stop, stop, don't hurt yourself. And um, he, he shares the good news with the jailer. And it says that that night, the jailer, he believed. And he says, what do we got to do to be saved? And he says, believe and repent and be baptized. And that same evening, the jailer got baptized. He and his entire household, they were saved. They became followers of Christ. And uh, 
Many scholars believe that likely it was this jailer that Paul and his team discipled and, and, and trained to eventually become the pastor of the church there in the city of Philippi. So I'm kind of giving you a backdrop to this church. Where did it come from? How did it start? It started from, from Paul's second missionary journey when he goes through the city of Philippi, this church's birth. The Bible doesn't record specifically who the leaders are, but we know of some of these characters, including Lydia and this jailer. And uh, Paul then begins to brag about them to other churches. Uh, he talks about their generosity. Uh, they partnered with him in ministry. They gave large amounts of money just lavishly because they believed in the good news that Paul was preaching. They had experienced it for themselves, and they wanted to partner with him wherever he would go. So they gave lavishly and generously, and Paul then begins to just brag on them and exhort them. The theme for this book you'll find the word joy or the word rejoice multiple times throughout this book. And uh, Paul, he talks about how, how joyful he is every time he thinks about them. But then he also turns and encourages them, hey, rejoice, y'all. Rejoice with what God's doing. Rejoice in how God is using you. And he says, don't just rejoice, but I want to encourage you again, rejoice. And like this double emphasis of being mindful, being reminded that we're constantly supposed to be uh, reminded of how God has been good to us and how, how he wants to use us for his purposes. So what I'm going to do today in this first segment is um, I'm going to just take a few verses from the first chapter. And again, there are four chapters in this book, and we're going to divide them into different sections. And uh, I want to look at verses 1 through 11, and uh, I'll read from the NLT version. And there, right in your small group, you can either open your Bible on your phone or your real Bible, whatever it is, and to kind of tag along with me. So let me read. It says, this letter is from Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus. I am writing to all of God's holy people in Philippi who belong to Christ Jesus, including the elders and the deacons. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. Again, just, just as a backdrop, Paul is writing to the church. At this stage of his life, he's already, he's been uh, in prison. He's a prisoner. Scholars debate whether he was in Ephesus or whether he was in Rome. Most believe that at this point he was already uh, a prisoner in Rome waiting for an eventual meeting with Caesar and whatnot. But nonetheless, he is a prisoner and he's talking to them from a place of, if you will, bondage where he doesn't have physical freedom, but he's encouraging them and he's thinking about them in the city of Philippi, remembering the good old days that he had with them. So he continues to, to, uh, to communicate here. Verse three says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my request for all of you with joy for you have been... Um, my partners in spreading the good news about Christ Jesus. Now, this portion right here, this, this, this little passage, it says good news, referring to the gospel. It's repeated several times through the book of Philippians, and it's, it's very interesting. In my Bible, I've got it circled. So, for you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time that you first heard it until now. And I am certain that God who began a good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. So another very, very key thought right here. And we, many Christians, we quote this verse. We're confident of this, that the God who began a good work in us, he is faithful to complete that work. And this is what Paul is reminding them. He remembers them from day one when they first believed and the journey that they had been on. Verse 7, it says, So it is right that I should feel as I do about all of you, for you have a special place in my heart you share with me the special favor of God, both in my imprisonment and in defending and confirming the truth of the good news. God knows how much I love you and long for you with the tender compassion of Christ Jesus. Again, it's getting real personal with him. He's, I imagine as he's writing this, he's getting all choked up because he loves these people and he remembers the beautiful work that God did in their lives there in Philippi. For Paul, in his case, it was a painful process because uh, he took a beating. I mean, literally, it's recorded. He was, he was shackled. They whooped that boy up, him and, and Silas, and uh, they were thrown into that, that jail cell. And uh, uh, it was painful, but it was worth it. And because of that pain, because of that struggle, there was such a connection with the people there. And from that, there's beauty, and, and he's, he's just rejoicing in, in those memories. Verse 9, I pray that your love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in knowledge and understanding. For I want you to understand what really matters. And right here, my, my Bible, I underlined that. What really matters? This is, I want you guys to understand what really matters so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day of Christ's return. And then he concludes this segment by saying, 
May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. The idea there, the evidence, the results of your salvation, which is the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. He's talking about this journey that they're in, and he remembers when they were first brand new babes in the kingdom and how they've blossomed, they've matured, and they've grown. And he's talking about this process. I want to talk about for the next few moments here, and then I'll let you guys just kind of discuss among, amongst yourselves. I want to bring out three thoughts that kind of jump out to me from this passage. There's actually a handful of other great things that we could talk about, but I want to focus on three things. Speaking of the gospel, speaking of the good news. See, Paul right here, he is excited, he's motivated, he's passionate because he recognized how the good news had reached them. It probably wasn't the most comfortable route to take in order to get there, but when they believed and when they received the gospel, the good news, he began to see that transformation and how they began to be conformed more and more into the image of the person of Jesus. And that he remembers that. And he's rehearsing and he's celebrating and, and reminding them uh, of that journey that they had been on. So three thoughts that jump out to me, and I'll ju just uh, mention a couple of verses. From verse three, it says, every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to God. <laughs> Imagine that. Paul, Paul, every time he's thinking of, uh, of the good food in Philippi, the good moments in Philippi, he also is reminded of the friendships that he has there, and he prays. And he says a couple little prayers here and there, and he's, he's just so grateful to God for that connection and for the work that God's done there. You know, when I, when I think about church life, I praise God that in my life growing up, I had people there that were, were there for me. And the gospel in, the, in, in this case was not just a, a religious thing, but it was a personal thing. And I remember people that like, like poured into my life and they were faithful to, to call me out on things and to point me towards the way, to point me towards Jesus. You know, there were a lot of religious figures and a lot of voices, but there were people that cared about me. And though I was jacked up, I still am, um, they would have patience and they would come after me and lovingly point me to Jesus. And, uh, and this is what I think of Paul when he thinks of that jailer, perhaps, and the family and Lydia and the people that were there. It's like, man, every time I think about you guys, I give thanks to God for you. And uh, I imagine I, and I wonder, what about you right there in your small group? Who is it that thanks God because of you? because of the friendships that you guys have, because of the things that God has uh, allowed you to be a part of. Who prays for you? Who thinks about you? Who do you thank uh, God for when it comes to your life? Who are you pouring your life into? And um, uh, he goes on to say, Paul, in verse 7, he says, he, referring to these folks, he says, you guys have a special place in my heart. You have a special place in my heart. See, for him, ministry wasn't just a job. It was just a lifestyle, and it was personal. Here's the first thought that I want to mention. When it comes to the good news, when it comes to the gospel, it is always personal. It's a personal thing. It's not just a random coincidence. It's not just a random religious thing. The gospel is always personal. And the way that it works is God uses people to reach other people. Can people watch online and tune into TV programs or whatever and hear the gospel and hear others preach? Yes, but the most effective way for the gospel to continue to grow in people's lives is when there's a personal connection. That's why I love small groups. That's why I love these life groups where people can kind of hang out, get together and grow together. So if you're taking notes, if you're jotting these thoughts down, the gospel is always personal. The second thought then is um, found in verse six. He talks about the God who began a good work within you. He's going to continue to do this work. Now, praise God that when it comes to salvation, yes, there is there's that first moment where we believe and our eyes are open and we got we become aware of like, wow, I was lost, but now I'm found and I'm born again. I'm alive on the inside. And but that's just that's not the checkered flag. That's the green flag, meaning the race starts there. A new season starts there. And it's a process. It's a journey. And Paul talks about, he says, hey, the God, I'm confident of this, the God who began that work in you because I was there and I saw it with my own eyes. I saw that, that work begin in you. He says, I'm confident that this God, he's going to complete the work that he started. And I was encouraged, Pastor Marquis just recently preaching on a Sunday. He, he alluded to this thought right here. He goes, man, I am confident of God's hand that he can complete that work in our lives. And if it were up to us, we probably would have derailed a long time ago. But we're confident that the God who began a good work in our lives, he's faithful, he's capable, he's willing, he is able to fulfill that work in us if we just allow him to, right? 
And Paul is, is encouraging them, says, you know, that God, the God who began a good work within you, he's going to complete it. And then verse 9, he says, I pray that you will keep on growing in your knowledge and, and in your under, understanding. He says, you got to keep on growing. And what this speaks to me about, if the first thought was that the gospel is personal, the second thought is that the gospel is a process. It's a journey. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not earning our salvation. Don't misunderstand what I'm trying to say here. At the moment that you believed and you, you invited Jesus to come into your heart, salvation took place in your heart already. So the gospel phew, caused you to become born again. You're alive. You're saved. But then there's also a journey of us growing in our faith. And there's a, there's a process of us putting away the, the old lifestyle, the old ways of, of, of doing things and, and putting on Christ. Paul actually writing from Rome in, a, in another book in the New Testament, he talks about that old sinful nature that we have, it being like a, a, a corpse, a dead body hanging on to us. And the way that they would uh, uh, bring, if you will, a capital punishment back in those days uh, in, in the Roman uh, Empire culture, uh, if someone was sentenced to death, they, they would either crucify them, they had some grotesque ways of killing them, one of which was they would oftentimes find a, a dead body, a corpse, whether it was a child, a soldier, you know, someone fell off their, their camel and died, I don't know. But um, uh, if, if, the, if the prisoner had been sentenced to death, one of the ways that they would kill him, and it was a painful and grotesque way, was they would uh, unclothe this prisoner, so they'd take their clothes off, and they would find this dead body, and they would attach that dead body to, to the prisoner that was sentenced to death, they would, they would wrap him with leather, uh, you know, belts and, and wraps and whatnot. And then that corpse would just kind of sag on that prisoner and that decay then would start to eat into the live person's body. It was just grotesque, nasty. And, it, and this killing agent that was working in that corpse, that decay and that nastiness would start eating into that flesh and it would eventually kill the prisoner. That was just grotesque and sorry if you're eating some food there. But it, Paul's talking about the old nature, the old process is much like that. We got to rid ourselves and cut off the old ways of thinking, the old ways of living. Sin is a killing agent. He says, you got to take off the old man, the old nature and put on the new man. So it's a work in progress getting rid of the things of the past and putting on the things that are of Christ. So it's a process. The gospel is good news. Amen. It's personal. And then it's also a process. And then finally, another thought that jumps out to me is from verse 10, where it says, for I want you to understand what really matters. Paul says, I want you to understand what really matters. See, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of ideas, but then there are certain things that really do matter. And he says, I want you guys to really understand this. Get this down in your head and in your heart. And he goes on in verse 11 to say, may you always be filled with the fruit or the evidence of your salvation. It's kind of show and tell. If God indeed did a, a new work in you, if the good news reached you and God is working within you, then there's going to be proof. There's going to be proof in the pudding, if you will. There's going to be fruit that is very obvious evidence, conclusive evidence. And that is, he, he explains, he says, it's the righteous character that, that is produced within you by Christ himself. So you can't put on a facade or a show and, and hang these artificial fruits, if you will, from the external. Christ has to produce that fruit by his spirit inside of you. And he says, the evidence will speak for itself. If you are of Christ, what will come out from you are Christ-like behaviors and attitudes. If you're of religion, then you're going to have religious attitudes. But if Christ is working in you, that fruit will be very evident for all to see. Here's what I want to, I want to point out. If the first thought was that the gospel is personal, the second thought is the gospel is a process. The third thought then would be the gospel, it produces good results. We don't have to impress God. We don't have to try to produce those results if we're just connected to Christ, if we're just pursuing him, he then will work within us and he's going to produce that good fruit in our lives. So I want to kind of conclude this time just encouraging us once again. How is it that we grow in God? We got to connect to him. Spend time pursuing him. Your prayers don't have to be fancy, but just be real. You can pray with your eyes wide open if you have to. But pursue God and say, God, work in my life. Jesus, thank you for the good news. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for coming and saving me. Thank you that you're, you're part of this journey, God, and that you're the one that, 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 that has the steering wheel, and I'm along for the ride, and thank you, Lord, that you're taking me into a better place. God, continue to produce your fruit in my life. Less of me, more of you. Less of that old sinful nature and more of your perfect, pure nature. 
So I hope these thoughts encourage you as you guys continue your time here in your small groups. Encourage one another. Maybe share some ideas of how you've grown in your journey. And listen, y'all, none of us have arrived there. We're going to be talking about how we press on towards the higher things of God. Be blessed. Have a great time. Bye-bye.